work in a lot of areas of music technology. He has uh, degrees in composition and in computer science uh, from uh, Hebrew University. He spent time in IRCAM and also in Beersheba University. And today he's going to tell us about his research. So usually, you know, the floor is walking and then I was already on stage. Okay, I hope I'll get the claps when I'm done too. Uh, all right, so thank you for having me. Uh, so the topic, uh, music information d dynamics, um, and I'll, I'll show two, two applications for analysis and improvisation. So let me just get straight to the uh, talk. So uh, it actually comprises of almost two disjoint parts. So I'll, uh, I'll give a general motivation that tries to ground the work uh, in questions of musical perception and not specifically even for musical perception, but the idea of expectancies and surprise. But then I'll talk about musical information dynamics, which uh, I think is an emergent, uh, I don't know, field or area of research inside music information retrieval world uh, that tries to use information theory kind of to characterize the evolution of musical content uh, over time. And again, that's kind of related to whether we perceive music this way. Um, and pretty much here I'll draw a line and do something else, which is machine improvisation. So if the first part is more about machine perception, the second part is just generative music systems. And it's, uh, it has been a long work um, in collaboration with IRCAM, and some people are familiar with the work or took part in it. Uh, so, uh, and that's, that's a small demo I will do. And eventually I'll talk about uh, Audio Oracle, which is something I'm excited about. And uh, the reason is that uh, Audio Oracle is an extension of these music improvisation mechanisms or generative systems that starts including some uh, music perception aspects. So the information dynamics using the Audio Oracle is actually kind of the highlight of this thing, which hopefully will link these two things together. And the demos, I mean, as, as much as time permits, uh, um, thanks to Benjamin Levy, who uh, actually is in charge of developing OMAX, and of course the team of Gerard Sayag in IRCAM, and um, Greg Surges, who is my PhD student in UCSD, who is working on the Audio Oracle aspects, um, and we have a nice Python implementation, so we'll be happy to share if people are interested. And there is also a MATLAB folder version of Audio Oracle. So, Let's me motivate you with musical expectancy. So why, and again, this talk is kind of music slash engineering. So I'll try kind of to be in the middle ground here. Uh, hopefully somebody will learn something new from every field. Uh, I hope not to disappoint both. So um, the idea that listening to music consists of forming expectations and then basically what the composer does, it creates anticipations of what's going to happen and he can either fulfill it or deny it, okay? And this idea was floated a long time ago. I would say the, the main first reference would be uh, Le Leonard Mayer in 1956. He has a book about emotions in music, and we kind of uh, grounded this, this idea. And uh, more specifically about melody, uh, musical theorist Narmour, uh, Eugene Narmour in 1990, uh, wrote a book where he uh, suggested what they called implication realization model, where the idea is that you know, melodic movement implies something. So let's say you have a big jump, da da, whatever, and then your natural expectation is to balance it down. Okay. So if you think about love story, da 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 da. So the, the, these profiles, the jumps, you know, suggest something, some emotion. Then you have to relax it with smaller with smaller steps uh, in the opposite direction. So I actually created several different ca categories of these movements. And people use this to analyze and to understand basically why melody has such specific profiles. Okay, and then and most recently, uh, there is the book by uh, Huron uh, called *Sweet Anticipations*, where he proposes his Itpra theory, basically extending this whole idea that people expect things and then different emotional reactions happen. He actually defines these uh, five elements: you know, kind of long-term imagination. You imagine something will happen, then before it happens, you have tension. Then after actually an event happens, you have these two responses. One is kind of bodily reaction. It could be freezing or uh, you, know, you, can, you can freeze, you can flee, um, basically. And then there is this idea whether your predictions were correct or not. 
And after some time passes, you actually do an appraisal, and you try to see if, if your ideas were working or not, if you expected something good or not. So just as an example, more for the musicians, so you have this dominant chord, first one, the G, with an inversion, and then you anticipate the resolution to the tonic, and then you have this suspended note or anticipating note, the C that comes before, it creates more tension, it's an unpleasant chord, but now you know for sure that C is going to come, and then you have this resolution, and he tries actually to explain different, you know, the sensation or the, the emotions we have about this simple chord progression, melodic and chord progression, using these theories. So, um, you know, it's not only in music that people speak about anticipation, surprise, um, motivated by neural models, but actually applied mostly to video. Itin Baldi created this Bayesian surprise model where the idea is that, uh, well, you can think about this as a neuron, but you can think about this as any kind of system, create some prior beliefs, and then when new data arrives, it, it makes posterior beliefs, and when the model doesn't fit the beliefs, that's where there is a big discrepancy, and this is where the surprise will happen. So if you have a set of models which are supported by some data, and then every new sample slightly adjusts the model, at a certain point, well, your models have changed so much that you actually have to switch your model, and that's where surprisal happens. Surprisal has been also investigated in, in speech or in, in computational linguistics, expectation-based syntactic comprehension, uh, Roger Leva in UCSD. Um, he actually defines event surprisal explicitly uh, as uh, you know, inverse probability, log probability of a given word given, given the context. And he measured this by uh, testing how difficult it is for readers to comprehend the text. Basically using eye movements, tracking eye movements uh, to see the difficulty in word processing. And of course, you know, uh, or at least what he claims, you know, of course it's more intuitive, but he actually tries to show that highly predictable words are easier or read more quickly. So the idea is that there is some kind of a structural representation that we have of the text, the sound, the videos, whatever the world, okay? And then when something um, kind of goes wrong or changes the structural representation, that's where surprise it all happens. So I think in text, some convincing examples are the garden path effect. So the idea like the old man, the boats, actually takes you a while to understand why this sentence makes sense because it kind of doesn't mean make sense. Man is actually a verb, not, not a noun, okay? So uh, you kind of try to predict something, you create a model, but then a new data arrives and then suddenly your model doesn't work anymore. So you have to go and refine your model and this is where the surprise will happen. So if you, the old man makes sense, the old man, the boats, you have to switch models. You have to re-label re, uh, the man. And uh, some other examples, I mean, I will skip them just for the sake of time efficiency, but the conclusions are, you know, ambiguities actually make it easier for people to read the text. And, uh, you know, if, if the dependencies are very long, if you have to basically to revisit the whole sentence to make sense out of it, that also makes it hard. So, uh, I would say the takeaway message is really that there are expectations. Now, kind of a, from a different angle, there is this idea of an aesthetic measure, which was actually first suggested by Birkhoff, and then uh, Benz formulated this in terms of entropy and complexity. So how do we switch? How do we get to the idea of uh, aesthetics from surprisal? That I'll try to reconcile the two in a second. But the idea is that objects are beautiful if they have a lot of order. And then how do you measure this order? Well, basically um, one proposal, which is the most quantitative, is to measure some kind of a entropy or complexity of the object before you try to predict, before you try to find symmetries. Most of the work done in this area of computational aesthetics is visual, and I'll show you an example in a second. But the idea is that when you see an image, you basically try to make sense out of it by compressing it, or by trying to find a simpler representation for the data that you have. So Kx is the complexity after applying some compression. Hx is some base level entropy. You can think about this just counting the number of parts or elements in the, in the image. And in a second, when I'll talk about information dynamics, we will use this 
whatever, the complexity after compression as the conditional entropy between the past and, or the present and the past. Between the, the present and the past, that's our measure, okay? There's some other measures that actually look at the future and the past, and I'll mention them as well, okay? But the idea really is, and here's an example of, of a paper from a computer a graphics magazine, um, pretty recent, where um, the authors used different compression algorithms to basically measure the beauty of these different images. And the baseline entropy would be just a normal Shannon entropy, either using you know, RGB elements or using the luminance. And then the compression is done using existing algorithms like JPEG and MPEG, uh, JPEG and PNG. And uh, in some sense, what it says is that you know, if you think about JPEG as, as a robot, as, as an intelligent whatever entity, which is not supposed to be, but let's say that's what it does. It tries to represent the image in terms of some DCT coefficients and kind of compress it in some way. It does some work. And if the image was complicated or complex before and JPEG did a good job compressing it, it will find it beautiful. So these images or these tables basically tell you how beautiful the images are in the eyes of the JPEG program, okay, or the PNG program. But, but this is the idea, basically. You have some baseline entropy, whatever is the way to calculate is RGB or Shannon entropy, either the, the entropy limit, and then K, which will be the number of bits using a compression algorithm. So why I mention this? Because I think understanding images, understanding sounds, first of all, can you use these tools, compression tools, and I think the concept itself is very much related to some perception of aesthetics, which we actually in music tend to call many times emotions, but it's not really that we have emotions about music. It kind of makes us feel things, but I think we still lack the vocabulary. So whatever you call it, uh, aesthetics, emotions, it's kind of related. So what is musical information dynamics? Actually dealing with very much the same problem, yes? If you translate this to video, well, I mean, I haven't seen work that try to do this for video. I mean, there are works that try to segment video and create some dynamical models that predict. I haven't seen any work done that actually tries to, let's say, analyze the, the frame rate. I mean, there was a work on computational media aesthetics from some people about a decade ago that analyzed the beat structure of film. And uh, I think they had some conclusions about aesthetics in that sense, but it was not using predictability as far as I know. So the also in trying to do motion capture and dance in the same way. Mm -hmm. I think well, I think it would be interesting to see how predictable because I think a lot of you know, the art, the general concept of creating art is making some kind of a statement, creating some premise, and then playing with it. So, I mean, this idea that you have, I think it's general to a lot of creative work. I mean, the idea that you, you start with something and you start transforming it, and the audience tries to follow that. So, I think that would be very interesting and not straightforward because different features and different models, but an application. So musical information dynamics uh, actually uses you know, the Shannon channel model to explain listening. So if listening is a communication process, one idea is, first of all, that it triggers all kinds of cognitive things in the listener, like compression could be one of them. And then expectancies are actually reducing complexity. So unlike JPEG that you know, does the compression using some transforms, here you actually make predictions. So this is makes it kind of more towards a time domain, okay? And in that sense, most informative is also most beautiful, but this is my statement. You know, musical information dynamics is usually not considered as computational aesthetics as such. So there are several information dynamics measures proposed, and they all assume pretty much the same thing we saw with events, is there is some entropy of the source and some entropy, okay, at the receiver who actually has some prior knowledge. So in this case, Z would be the past and X is the present. So there is this information dynamics measure, which I call information rate, something that I, um, I have been working on and proposed it and developed it. There are some other works which, uh, uh, so this, the next one is called prediction, uh, so one is information rate, the second one is predictive information rate. Um, so information rate uses information between present and entire past. So this is the present and this is the past because the, the, the receiver has the knowledge of the past. He already heard music before. 
In the case of predictive information, there is another element which is past, future, and present. So it's slightly different variation. You know, I won't have time really to define them, but um, sorry. So there is the predictive information, which is information in the recent past and the entire future, which was proposed uh, totally unrelated to music, and I'll show an example. And there is the predictive information rate, which is information in the present about the entire future given the entire past. So the whole idea that we want to measure this, you know, mutual information that passes over time. Even then, there is a big argument. Um, what is the right measure? Okay, whether it's the present, the past, the past, the present, the future. But I mean, I think that the overall uh, framework is is pretty common. And I will be focusing on the first one, which is the information rate, the top one, which is this thing that I've been working on. So predictive information is by Bialik and Tishby, used more for neural coding, mutual information being a fixed block of past data and the future. And then there is a, you know, a group in, in London. Actually, they have a European project uh, funded group called Musical Information Dynamics uh, by um, Samar Abdallah and Mark Plumley. And they have this predictive information rate that is slightly different. It's the present and the future given the past. Okay. Um, if you have questions, I have some examples to demonstrate the difference between them. But um, at this point, I'm just kind of redoing the definitions. So you have two random variables, source and channel. You have y is the past experience, what you heard so far. x is the new material. Hx is uncertainty about the present if you don't know anything about it. Hx given y, uncertainty about the present when you know the past. And Ixy is the, the mutual information between the present and the past. Now, predictive information was used for engineering applications. This is one example of uh, trying to control the gain of a robot. So there is a robot here that basically bounces around. It's blind, doesn't know anything. It just moves forward. It has a certain gain of kind of control. It bounces, and then um, they were basically repeating these experiments, trying to see where the data they get from the sensors is um, is optimal in terms of the ability to predict the next step from the previous step. And this is how they control the gain. And yes. Yeah, for those of us who don't come from the music computational music background, so. Uh, Entropies and, and uh, information theories are based over densities over some state space. Right. Briefly, what are the state spaces over which you're talking about these uncertainties? That's a great question. So, uh, I'll, I'll show a demo where we kind of try to estimate these things uh, using audio features. So, I mean, actually, it's a little bit even before the state space because features have to be either quantized. You have to have some kind of latent model <laughs> because the features themselves are continuous variables. Uh, if if you speak about discrete alphabet, then the alphabet. So the features. So you're you're inducing. You're, you're talking about induced densities over uh, the feature space. Right. Okay. Feature space, and if it's discrete, that will be the alphabet. And if it's a feature space, you have to do something. And here, that was basically the readings of the sensor, the, the axis that they that they read from. Um, Okay, so uh, just an example, you know, uh, what is, let's say you have a Markov chain with a finite state space. Uh, in this case, it's discrete. So, um, you know, if, if you look up textbook solutions uh, for what is the entropy of a Markov process uh, and that the Markov process has a stable state, so the entropy of the stable state solution is just the definition of the entropy. This is the entropy rate, which is the conditional entropy. It actually has the transition matrix here. And then you can actually have the information rate. So the information rate is the entropy of the stable state solution minus the entropy rate. The predictive information rate, because it uses future and the present. So it's actually two steps in the future minus one step. And I can show examples where you know, one is maximized, one is not. Okay? Now, whether one is more beautiful, one is more relevant to music or not, that's really, in some sense, it's an ongoing discussion. Um, the, the London people, the Queen's Mary people, Samar Abdallah and actually one of one of the students of Mark Pombley, they use this information dynamics as a meta control interface. And again, the idea is that you can map, this is really just using first order Markov chains to generate melodies. And unfortunately, these are very, you know, this model for melodic generation, although it's very popular in music, in experimental music, it cannot really capture melodies. It creates pretty much random melodies with little bit dependencies. 
it's, it, but you can still populate every point here corresponds to a different Markov matrix. And the, basically one of the reasons for creating this, uh, no, they actually had an installation, now they create a mobile application is, uh, well, it's fun maybe, you can move and decide which melodies you want to generate, but it's also their way to experiment with, with and validate the idea that, so here what they have, what they call now redundancy is the information rate, here's the entropy rate, actually two axes, and on top of this, the white and the black is their predictive information rate, and uh, what they want to test the hypothesis by allowing people to play with this is actually to they claim that people prefer higher predictive information rate as the melody they feel best, you know, that is most aesthetic. So it's kind of a way to validate this whole idea that predict predictive information rate is a valid aesthetic measure is by allowing people to play with this control and gather that information and then actually kind of have validate that assumption, okay? Now, um, what about kind of perceptual co correlates from real music? So, uh, in 2006, a paper came, came out uh, with uh, Stephen McAdams, uh, who is a cognitive musicology uh, researcher, and Ro Roger Reynolds, a composer, where uh, my part was actually doing the, the statistical modeling uh, of, uh, of the audio signal. And the two measures that you know Steve McAdams provided for me, based on Roger Reynolds' data, is uh, people were asked to move sliders, and basically they have judgments of familiarity, whatever that means, and emotional force. So they had sliders and they would move them. There were like four experiments done. What I tried to do is create the signal measures. So for familiarity, which is kind of a larger, larger scope similarity, I used um, spectral clustering. Uh, and generalized eigenvector, which is a way to segment the things, and it's done in video. So I apply this to, to audio. And for the emotional force, actually I used, you know, the first estimate of information rate uh, that I came up with was uh, some linear prediction and the correlation, which I'll show in a second. So what we had for the first part, which is the larger scale, for those of you who are familiar with the similarity matrices in music, you basically take the sound features. Again, sound features, if you don't have any better distance measure, you just do a dot product, okay? So every point here actually is, is, is a dot product between two feature vectors. And it kind of shows the repetition of the structures. Sometimes if you see lines here, you couldn't see lines. There are actually melodies that repeat, okay? Now, if you take this, self-similarity matrix, you normalize it and you think about this as a Markov mark matrix, then basically what I wrote here, plotted here, I mean the vector here, which is the eigenvector, that's the stable state solution. So in some sense, the underlying assumption doing this analysis is that the self-similarity of that music is the Markovian first order chain behavior of that music. So if you, and if you basically keep on generating just using this structure, you'll create a signal that has certain probability profiles for every state. And the reason I have two, one is the computed one, which is the blue, and, and the red one is the human responses, okay? So the human responses, of course, have this time element because they didn't hear anything, so they couldn't have familiarity in the beginning, while my analysis doesn't assume any, you know, uh, online or progressive listening. But if you ignore this part, I think it has kind of an interesting suggestion that there is a fit between you know, the repetition model of a larger structure, basically the stable state kind of solution of that model and what people judge as similarity. So, so similarity profile was derived using spectral clustering analysis, okay, uh, of a sequence of capsule features using 200 millisecond frames. For, for the short term prediction, which I think explains, interestingly, the emotional force. Uh, I did something else. Basically, I used spectral flatness measure, uh, if people know what it is, but basically it measures the, the, how flat the spectrum is. And it's a measure of how, how well you can actually have, how well you can predict the process using an autoregressive model, okay? So if you have a linear predictor, 
And you can actually show that the compression gain of a linear predictor is proportional to spectral flatness. It's just easier to measure spectral flatness. So what, it, what, what I did, I take a sound, I create basically capstream analysis over shorter frames. Then, because it's a vector, and this works only on a single signal, I, I needed to decompose them in some kind of an independent way. You know, since ICA didn't work so well, I just did PCA, and then on every on every decorrelated channel, I calculate the spectral flatness measures, sum them together. It was actually an IEEE paper um, and also a computer music journal paper that describes this method. So if I do this, this is the correlation between emotional force of, of, uh, uh, of human subjects in red and the information rate, which is now calculated basically doing kind of a window-based prediction of the features themselves using linear prediction, okay? So macro frames of three seconds, again, capture of flames, but they're decorrelated. So that was kind of the motivation. Then I kind of tried to explain both the long term and the short term in another IEEE paper, which is called kind of unified model, blah, blah, blah. So the title is long, but the idea is you have two graphs. One is the long term, one is the, one is the spectral clustering, one is the, the information rate. I call it the vector information rate just to to show why, why the vector part is. So I was kind of trying to see if this could be used for, let's say, interest point detection. And the, the intuition, the musical intuition behind was, you know, if you have a musical climax, it must be novel on the long term, the structural level, but it has to be very predictable on the surface level. That's just a musical intuition. I can give some musical examples that kind of make this maybe more relevant. But the idea is that, again, I had to quantize these two graphs and basically I was looking for one high, one low, and these were the detection points. I used this on several musical examples. So these were like three different, four different performances of the same Bach prelude. And then kind of I look for the maximum difference between these two measures, here, here, and here, and whatever here. And they all ended up somewhere around these three bars, which I think if, you, if you're familiar with the piece, I didn't, uh, include here the recording, but it's kind of a climax. It, it's, it's a big change in that, in that piece, okay? But you can see in terms of the texture, it's kind of very predictable. So um, that's kind of the general idea. Now, we're like halfway through the lecture, so let me switch to the other topic, which is the machine improvisation, okay? So you know, we make a switch, and then I'll try to combine it. So the idea that you can generate music by random procedures which are in music often called aleatoric procedures, uh, is not new. And if you have, if your building blocks are smart enough, you can actually create a very convincing music. Okay, of course, if your building blocks are single notes and Markov dynamics is not very interesting, but if you have phrases, then you can actually create, you know, there is this famous example of the Mozart dice game where he actually published a set of one bar musical excerpts which made sense in the sense that you can recombine them in any way and you would create uh, some sort of a polonaise or another musical, short musical piece. So in some sense, it's, it's a cheating because you, re you manually compose things that actually make sense and then you basically create ways of recombining them um, and this is all handmade. But the idea of machine improvisation in some sense was to have a machine learning algorithm and apply this to music that is not like very nicely you know, harmonically and metrically based into frames that could be reshuffled, but actually find all kinds of models. And then these models are learn, learn to fly, but then they're triggered. So while the musician is improvising, we have this stylistic reinjection idea. So uh, you can actually trigger variations on the music that somebody else already, or the, the performer already uh, played. So, um, and it's controlled by human uh, operator. Some other meta creation systems, and I call it meta creation because you don't really control, you don't create the music, you control, but you create it using some other higher level parameters. So I think the most famous is Sony's continuator, actually, that uses um, the Lempel Ziv method, uh, which was earlier proposed by Jalav and myself uh, and others, and then um, others from from IRCAM, not from Sony. So 
Uh, you can guess from my intonation that you know, I'm not very happy with the Sony patenting something uh, from our work, but that's, that's, that's a product they have. Uh, I don't think it's commercially bringing money, but they have this continuator project. Mimi uh, Elaine Chu, who was in um, University of Southern California, now you moved actually to the team of Plumbly and, uh, and Abdallah, um, is another version of, uh, of sort of a continuator system. Uh, been out of the box, and you know, people are interested. There was a recent symposium on, on musical meta creation in um, uh, 2012, and um, with the AAAI, which is the Association for AI. Uh, there is a link to the website, and, and another, the other link is just a lot of algorithmic composition software stuff. So I can give you these slides with links if you're interested. So what is the machine improvisation thing? So you have a live improviser and you have Jahar here as a controller. You can use this to capture stuff uh, or you can use this to generate music. Uh, I don't know how the time permits. Uh, let me switch quickly maybe to the, uh, to the demo, although I think the demo comes slightly later. Okay, but I just, for the sake, I'll just play a very brief excerpt. So here you have the musician performing and this is captured on the fly so this is the style of music that you know is specific to the improviser and at a certain point you'll see that the sound that you hear right it's kind of playing in his style but it's not him playing it anymore so it kind of grabs the structures and tries to trigger them and generate them in different ways okay and Gerard here is controlling this thing okay uh, this is a more classical example where we use this method to compose music by creating these models of different uh, pieces and basically blending them and creating a generative model that is joined to both of them. Uh, it uses the factor oracle. You know, I'll, I'll, follow, I'll follow the order of the slides, but uh, hopefully we'll have some time to demonstrate it. So what we use now is uh, coming from a, a text search algorithm called factor oracle. It's a finite state automation which is learned incrementally, and it recognizes all subsequences of factors in a, in a sequence. But it also has this other auxiliary type of structure that it builds while it creates the factor oracle, which are called the suffix links. And we actually use them for improvisation. So it has the forward transitions, and it has the backward links. So if this is the A, B, B, A, and now you want to search for a string, let's say B, B, okay? So you go B and B, and you know that B, B is found here, okay? Or if you want to search for whatever, uh, ABB, of course, it will be here. But if you want to search for BA, you will go B and A, and you find the ending point of that suffix. So it's, it's a very efficient um, text matching with our factor searching algorithm. And we use this. So here is a quick demo of the live system. What I loaded here okay, is this factor oracle graph which is created based on an existing composition. And I'll, I'll just generate some examples. And we'll see if you kind of recognize the piece, the original one, because now it's improvising. It's so quiet, it's, it's almost impossible to hear. But um, I don't know if you can hear that kind of a jazzy type of improvisation. So basically what it does, OK? So if I go and I, I create, you know, actually here I have some, some parameters for controlling how much context I want to use, how often will be the jumps happening now, will be jumping more often. If I would use this, will be jumping even more often. At a certain point, it will start remixing this whole thing in a crazy way. But if I go with this very high 
again, the gothic is very high, it will be just plain bang original piece. And this is a Jikuri improvisation, okay, as a mini file. So what we have is basically a structure, and here the interface is, is not, it's not perfect. I mean, it's, it's actually very, very cumbersome for somebody who's not familiar with the software. This part works on audio, so now we have an audio. This part works on MIDI. These are the players, you can trigger two of them in the same time. You can actually trigger another one, which will transpose and do stuff, which is not in the original sequence. You have these for, for audio counterpart. Here you have some, some parameters that control how much you know, continuity you require before you do a jump and how often you do the jumps. And the uh, continuity basically is this little control. So the darker lines are the ones which actually have a long common context, and the shorter, the white ones are very short common context. So we create a structure basically that allows you to do cut and paste operation on, on the sound. And the, the, the idea of this whole cut and paste is that anything that happens here, well, I don't know, if it's a black line, it's long. If it's a white line, it's short. But something that happened here also, if you follow that line, happens here. So if you jump between these points, you will not notice the difference because there was a common context. So uh, let me go back to the. So uh, there was, uh, you know, the most formal evaluation was done uh, actually almost uh, 10 years ago on, on an early version of the system, uh, kind of doing a Turing test, trying to compare between two live pianists and their two clones or synthetic improvisations. And, and kind of the most formal evaluation of the system was that uh, uh, approximately 50 percent people did correct detection, which is more than the random because it would be 25 percent. But I think the main takeaway message that at least I remember from this thing is that it takes people about from 20 to 51 seconds to, to reach a decision, which means that around 30 seconds, if you take this as, 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 a, as a mean, we do manage to pass the test, which means people cannot tell if it's a human, if it's human A, human B, clone A, clone B. After some time, they actually know that this is which who is the pianist and whether this is a computer or a pianist. So I think we did manage to, in some sense, prove that we can model musical structures up to about 30 seconds long to deceive people from knowing if this is human or not. Now, let me go to the audio oracle. So what, what is audio oracle? Actually, kind of to make a proper introduction of audio oracle, I should have said that you know, the way we worked there was using symbolic sequences. And when we worked on audio, we had to quantize the features into some alphabet. So Audio Oracle basically tries to avoid that. So uh, I would say the Audio Oracle in general belongs to this kind of ways of modeling things. It can be also used for, uh, for likelihood of comparison. And I want to kind of relate this to state of the art in music information retrieval. So first of all, a lot of music information retrieval work uses bag of features, which means it doesn't consider any kind of temporal structure, no musical form. There are some more recent work that use temporal models like hidden Markov models or dynamic texture models, which is more of a common filtering kind of thing. But they usually assume finite memory. It's, it's in a Markov, uh, first order Markov chains usually. Although they're general graphical models, but usually they're kind of first order Markov chains. And they're segmental in the sense that the hidden states are the ones that have the dynamics, but then once you're in a state, the, the, the variables are usually just generated randomly. So they're not very easy for generative purposes, although they do detect musical structures. So there are some recent work that tries to segment music and look really into the temporal structure rather than just label this you know, whole song with keywords. I think the predictive models are the solution. So we used Lampel Z first and uh, predictive uh, PPM, which is the partial, partial predictive models, I think. Uh, and then Factor Oracle and the Audio Oracle, which is this one. And they're also better for generative applications. So what is Audio Oracle? So we have the audio feature, the audio signal. We derive a bunch of features like the MFCCs. And then we create um, sort of a Factor Oracle. But it extends it to signals. It operates on feature vectors. It uses distances instead of exact matching. And it requires a threshold, but there is no quantization. Okay. Now, why this is important? Because uh, we want actually to be able to search for the best parameters. We want to search for the best features. We want to create best, uh, uh, best, best sequences in some sense. So the audio oracle structure is basically something like this. So you have the waveform and you have this graph. And uh, 
that's kind of the example. You can see that there is a repetition, but it actually finds the fine-grained recombinations. So you can generate more examples, which won't be exactly the same. And how we generate, we actually do random walk on the suffix links because of that kind of common context of property. It has this continuity parameter. We can constrain it according to the length of the common suffixes, with some rules to avoid loops. And then we basically go to the original audio and resynthesize it. So information rate using audio oracle is what I told you in the beginning what I'm excited about. And this is how we can use this model to infer about the predictability and the complexity and whatever, you know, the, the information rate. So instead of using entropy and conditional entropy, we actually use a compression algorithm that um, called Compror that was developed using on top of, uh, of the factor oracle. So what, what we do, we actually, instead of again entropies, we count the number of bits prior to and after using a compression algorithm. And then we plot this information rate graph. Uh, it allows optimal parameter and feature selection. How? Because what we can do now, we can generate a lot of these graphs for every value of threshold. So the matching is done with the threshold. So now we can have multiple graphs according to the threshold parameter. We do search over threshold parameters. We can also search on the window size. So we do feature selection because we can have short-term features. We can average features and do some clustering before. And uh, we can also search over different features. So every feature will generate a different factor oracle. But now we have some sort of a measure that tells you that you know that that graph that has the highest information rate overall is in some sense the best. So we have at least some criteria to select over or search over the space of you know thresholds within a feature, between features, and and you know at least the temporal resolution of the feature. And again, it comes back to the idea that the most informative is also most beautiful. So this is the information rate. Basically, we use the Compror algorithm that uses this compression. I'm just rewriting what I said in words here. So you have the coding lengths of a single letter versus coding lengths of a block. And this is the compression given. Okay, or the information rate. Just to give an example how Compro compresses a sequence. So if this is the original sequence, what it does, whenever it cannot compress, it just recopies the letter. Then I don't have the original oracle here, but you can see that this A is repeated. So you repeat, this is the recopy. This is how long you recopy, and this is from where. So you recopy one. A is repeated, B is new, then B is recopied from position three. But then the nice compression gain is here, what you do, okay? You take basically from position two, and you regenerate eight blocks. So if you look at this and this, they're the same. So you start recopying A, B, B, A, and then you keep on recopying, and then you actually create this. So this is the compression gain, and, and the factor oracle allows this representation. So we use this, and then the decoding, I just showed how it's done. It's straightforward. So here's the comparison between, if you remember, the old spectral clustering thing. That's this graph, OK? The, the continuous one, the noisy one. And this is one based on the, uh, on the audio oracle. This is manually segmented according to musical sections, exposition, exposition repeated. But any block. Long block here means that this segment was recopied from some earlier segment. So you can see that you have this very big recopying block. Here is a big recopied block. And actually, the big jumps kind of correspond to the changes in the musical structure. Of course, inside of it, there is also a lot of recopying. It's way smoother than doing this um, Markov kind of spectral clustering thing. And so, so the dotted thing is just this thing overlaid on top. So I mean, at least we have some validation that you know it doesn't fall far away from more simple models. It helps you visualize the musical structure. So this is that similarity matrix I showed before. Here we actually can see these melodic lines. You can actually draw the same thing from the oracle directly, just following these structures, and it kind of reveals the repetitions. So I think it gives you a better indication of of this self-similarity structure that at least in the music, uh, computer music area, people are familiar with. And then the main thing that I mentioned in the beginning, we can select parameters. So threshold selection is basically because now we have an information rate for a single symbol. We summarize this over the whole sequence, OK? Because everything is the same parameter. And we take the parameter which gives you the maximum. And that's the best oracle we choose. 
Okay, so if we search over thresholds, that's one. We can search over uh, window frames and, and so on. Uh, actually, the pilot and demo is just showing a video of the same things done. Uh, let me maybe show some of these results. So these are kind of the different, so this this now, this is from the Spy Python implementation. This is an Oracle created specifically for brightness feature, okay? This is an Oracle created for Centroid feature, okay? This is an Oracle created for MFCCs, okay? And so on. So first of all, we can have these different Oracles, and this is the best selected Oracle for different threshold values that we, that we find, okay? And you can imagine that, you know, these are the original MFCCs, multi, you know, multiple, basically it's a vector, right? You have these multiple coefficients. How do you make sense of the structure? So actually, so we go again, use the factor oracle, create the structure. From this structure, we can derive some things. And, and this already has this optimal threshold that was found. I mean, there was a search over multiple oracles while we were looking for the threshold, and that's the best oracle. So I hope that this will help us address a lot of questions about musical perception, because even when we did the first work with uh, Steve McAdams and and Roger Reynolds, the one about familiarity and, 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 and emotional force. There was, there was all this question, well, don't people change what they listen to? Maybe sometimes they listen to the spectrum. Maybe they listen to melody. Maybe they, they just dynamics, right? So you create this, every feature can create its own information rate, right? And we don't expect people to listen all the time to the same parameters. So we have multiple musical parameters. We don't really know how, and I was playing, I mean, by hand, I was trying to do a lot of graphs with different, you know, sizes of frames and, and, and play with the, uh, I mean, that, that work wasn't, wasn't using uh, the audio oracle, it was using linear prediction, but I was playing with different orders of models and a lot of parameters. So it never became a method I can just like, launch and give you and say, well, here it is, you know, just apply it to a signal, it will, it, will, it will also estimate. So now this is why I'm excited. I think first because there is this motivation, which is aesthetics and, 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 and listening and then psychoacoustics, but also it's a tool that actually will create some kind of a representation that I think is in some sense capturing the essence of the cell. So summary and conclusion, so I'll try to be on time. Uh, kind of in general, what are the music modeling paradigms? And this is very much parallel to things that people do in video. Uh, there is the idea that you have a signal, you have to extract features, but then these features really are too rich to um, to allow you to get into the essence of that information. So you have to define something which would be more like events. So if the features are, are male frequency or F0, the, you know, the fundamental, if you have multi-pinch, that's great, but usually we don't have multi-pinch detection, RMS or energy. But then you want to segment it. You might want to use source separation because these are mixtures. One thing which is common in, in music information retrieval is called audio basis, which could be done using a variety of things like you know, like ICA, PCA, uh, or NMF now. People use non-negative mat matrix factorization to find these things. But then you want to plug them into dynamical model, like hidden Markov model, linear dynamical systems like dynamic texture models. Of course, if you have grammars, or if you can learn grammars, that's also great. And I think our audio oracle kind of combines, it's actually somewhere in between because it tries to estimate the events with whatever. Now, events activities processes, I think, make sense if you think about the visual counterpart. So I actually borrow these terms from video research where the features will be whatever the features in the video and then events will be basically segment your video stream into events, but then activities will be repeated events and process will be the dynamical model. So actually the LDS, the dynamic texture models are taking, um, which is one of the methods that people now use uh, in for, for music information retrieval, uh, is actually adopted from video. If we want to go back to the idea of the audio oracle, you have the signal, you have the features, you either do the clustering or you don't, or you don't do the clustering, then you create some kind of a structure, and then you can actually think about what you do with this. Is this musical form? Do you control improvisation with this musical form and, s and so on? Uh, in general, you know, it's kind of multidisciplinary field. So the first part is more like DSP related. The second part is more machine learning. 
but you're gonna have to go through this whole path to do something useful. Uh, future work, uh, so there, there was a paper published last year with Arshia Khan, who is now in IRCAM, on using information geometry for segmentation. I think this is an interesting direction because we never know what's the right distance measure, but we can have some kind of unparametric insight about what is the distribution of features. Uh, there is the question of using short and long-term information rate from or the Oracle. So this is actively what we're looking into now. Uh, and also searching over the fe feature space. So I mentioned these two, you know, the size of the window and what feature we're using, selection. Then one application is really to replace Gerard. <laughs> Meta creation interface means maybe it's a, it's a better interface than what we saw here, or we can have an automatic model. When I say re replace Gerard, let me just briefly just jump in, because I said that, so I want to just explain what I meant. So if you have here a human controller who can decide on what segments we use and how much probability of jump we have and what is the continuity factor, and he has to memorize the music in some sense, and we have tools on that interface to mark repeating sections, and we can actually, all of that is based on some kind of aesthetic judgment of a human. So the fact that we had a music improvisation tool that creates music that can fool you over 30 seconds, well, beyond 30 seconds, we have to come up with some decision, okay? So maybe now we can have the next level of systems that takes the 30 second and higher challenge and can actually navigate the oracle in some way which is more aesthetically pleasing or in response to some other person's interaction and not just generate chunks of music imitation which might be good but they, they, they like this artistic intent. I think that's the best way I would characterize the problem with the existing oracle if it doesn't have the, you know, the, the machine listening element is that people realize that this music goes nowhere. Okay, it has no creative intent, it doesn't create some kind of a story. So, uh, so let me just quickly run through. Back, so I would say this, and of course we still need more cognitive validation. So I have a, an ongoing collaboration with a musicologist from the Hebrew University, Ronnie Granat. Uh, she has collected a lot of information about people listening either self-reported judgments of emotions uh, using valence and, and um, uh, you know, the, the, the emotional circle. And then, uh, and then she has also data about fMRI measurements of people listening to music. So they're very different measures, but they're uh, from subjects. We have these measures from the signals. We still don't know how to look at them together. Uh, but that's that's part of the task. So I would say that's it. And I was on time except for, I don't know if I have time for questions. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I know it was a lot and I was kind of doing this very fast, but I mean, uh, you can ask anything. <laughs> yeah. So, there's a question of sort of which, uh, which of the fundamental primitive elements that seem to decompose the signal best versus the question of which of the fundamental primitives that a human chunks the signal into. It's not clear that those have to be the same, at least not clear to me that those have to be the same. Is that, what, what is the relationship between those in terms of um, or, or do you do anything that tries to drive those to be similar in some way? Well, um, so one thing is, I mean, the features that we use are, are, are not really uh, going, down below. So Go, so going here no, and no. here. So, well, so whatever the, whatever the elements are that are the events and the activities, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's this, question, there's this question of whether or not the, the primitives that are pulled out by a mm -hmm. system that's doing some sort of automatic clustering segmentation and then trying to figure out the relation, you know, the elements that are going to go into the grammar, let's right. say, right. Sorry, whether those map onto anything that I would think of as being sort of primitive, you know, down to phrases, chord, you know, what, whatever it is. Do you do any, and, and yet, in order for me to maybe, maybe to be able to improvise well with this, I have to know that it's going to sort of latch onto the same types of things that I'm thinking about. Do you do anything that, that connects those in any way? Well, I mean, if, 
uh, if I uh, understood your question right, I think I understood it, but I, my, my answer would be actually we try not to do that in some sense. Uh, because a lot of the existing work kind of tries to, um, it's true that HMMs and LDSs are, um, um, well, I mean, they're supervised in some sense, but they, they're, not, not, they're not actual systems, right? You train them from right, there. Right, right. Uh, but you still have to design, in some sense, the model, and you have some assumptions. And you have to do the quantization before if it's an HMM, obvious uh, I kind of prefer that approach in the sense that you don't really try to, to explain. You don't, it's, it's not like in speech that you expect your, your states to be your quantums. Okay. I don't know what the states are, but even variables are. So I'm not saying that we don't need to have like clustering or, or latent variables in states that are larger because otherwise, yeah, we don't perceive everything in the same scale. But the idea in some sense in the audio oracle that I think is, is, is elegant is that we actually don't want this. Okay. So we kind of take feature, we create a whole structure, and then we actually ask a question, is the structure interesting? Then we take slightly different feature or same feature with different window size and then we evaluate the whole structure. So we don't have to limit ourselves to specific topologies of HMMs or specific assumptions. But of course, you know, the Oracle also creates very specific structure, but I mean, it has a little bit more freedom. Now to tell you that I'm sure that whenever it finds these thresholds, it actually will segment this to meaningful chunks. That's why we need the, the, the psychoacoustic validation, but it's not really on the level of chunking it and asking people if these are le relevant things. It's kind of on an overall, maybe trying to relate this to emotions, to some kind of physical measures. Because, yeah, I mean, I don't know really, and I don't believe so much. I'm not saying this is wrong. I'm just saying it's hard to come up with a segmentation that will correspond to human, that humans will tell you, yeah, that's correct. I mean, unless you work with really all right, I'll, ask, I'll okay. ask another question after somebody else asks. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Somebody else. <laughs> well, if you want to improvise with the system, play around. Welcome tomorrow. I'll, I'll, I'll set it up in the, yeah, this class. But uh, I got two questions. Take one. Yeah, pick one more question. I'll pick here. one. Okay, so the, it's related to the chunking thing. In the most recent chess playing programs. The machines will now do things that people find surprising. And one of the hypotheses about why it's surprising is because it has a natural induction of what its sort of bases are of sort of, uh, you know, what, why certain chunks of trees are removed totally, et cetera. And since that doesn't actually align with the way people do it, it will come up with a surprising, you know, kind of thing. And I was just wondering whether or not there was ever a thing where it sort of alternatively chunks, creates, breaks into segments. So it does something that in some sense is surprising because it doesn't feel like what a musician would do and yet there is a certain systematicity to it that is recognizable with respect to say emotion or, or whatever. Right. So in part of this uh, was this uh, Turing test kind of attempt to see what people think is, is natural or not. Uh, but I would say that uh, on, on a larger level, uh, I mean, the, the, the thing is that um, once, I would say that the, the good and part, part about the system is that it learns your own style, okay? So you actually expect it to be um, uh, kind of representative of your own improvisation. That's, what, that's why I think it was popular among th those who like it, but then there are people who don't like this system because what it does, it kind of creates kind of versions. It's parroting you, okay? So if I would say, yes, this is a creative, you know, a system that learns musical style, it can improvise in your style, and so, some, some musicians like it, and they want to have that. But I can describe the same th system in, in very derogative terms, and I know that others do. It says it's basically a smart delay, or it's a parrot. And I don't want anybody parroting me. <laughs> so I would say that uh, in that sense, it's not even the question of surprisal in the sense how well it imitates me. It's why do you want to have some kind of an avatar? Now, I know that you know, in visual research, there is this uncanny valley issue, right? That you, know, you try to imitate a human, you like it, you like it, and then you don't like it because it starts resembling you too much. I don't know if this happens in music. I, I don't know if any uncanny, I mean, it, it floats out there, but it's not that there is like this established effect. 
So I think the question is, depending on your style, your preferences, one of the problems, and you know, the beauty of doing music is really you have to find the person who actually finds <laughs> finds it useful and interesting, and while others would react very differently. So there are a lot of jazz musicians who enjoy and use the system, but I know that you know when I worked with some other musicians, some said, you know, I want to have a discourse. I have somebody to give me different ideas. I want somebody to oppose me. I don't want a system that generates more of the same style. Now to do that, you know, we probably need higher level understanding. So kind of avoided directly answering your question because I don't know the exact answer, but I mean, these are these different perspectives on the same problem. Okay, we're out of time now, but thank you very much. Thank you. Information retrieval tomorrow at 3 o'clock in the couch building. I'm just going to say hello and goodbye. <laughs>